the Honorable Justice Michael Moore, who is presiding, present in the session. Please be seated. On the matter of Timothy Symington v. Paul Silvernell, we're on record docket 2243-R0404. Your Honor, this is scheduled for a hearing after a notice. I ask that um, the parties please raise your right hands to be sworn in. No. Do you solemnly and severally swear that the testimony you should give in this case now in hearing should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so if you got. I do. On oh, my honor, I do. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Attorney Kennefick, you're representing Mr. Symington? I am, Your Honor. All right. And he's asking for an, uh, an issuance of a 25080 order. Is that correct? That's correct, Judge. All right. Attorney Estes, you're representing Mr. Silvernail? Yes, Your Honor. All right. And he's opposed any, I suppose, any a 25080 order? Absolutely. All right. I'll hear from you, Attorney Kennefick. Hey, I'm going to proceed partially by testimony, Judge, so I'm going to ask you to All right. Um, and I'm going to ask you to stand at the podium. Uh, I'm, I, I do have trouble hearing. Keep your voice up, and it's much easier for me to hear people rather than having them testify from the witness stand. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, that's good. Right. Will you identify yourself, please? Timothy Symington. Where do you live? Wilbraham. Okay. And um, right now, are you employed? I am employed, yes. Am... Uh, Wilbraham Public Library. Okay, and for how long have you been employed by the Public library. Uh, since March of 2022. And uh, sometime in April or May of 2022, um, did there become a, an interruption of your employment? Yes. What happened? Uh, I was put on uh, paid administrative leave for two months. Because of your understanding? Because a complaint was made about my past. Okay. And uh, were you subsequently reinstated? Yes, I was. And uh, subsequently, in September, sometime on or after September 29, 2022, um, were you again um, uh, put on some time of administrative leave? I was put on leave for two days. Okay. And did you have an understanding why that uh, took place? Yes. An email was sent to all the staff at the library by Mr. Silvernail. How many uh, people did, that, uh, did this email uh, go to? 49. And um, do, you know, does that, do, do you have a copy of that? Uh, I, uh, I I don't know, but I prefer you enter anything as an exhibit. Okay, I'm going to do that. No objection. No objection. So that'll be uh, plaintiff's exhibit one. I believe that was before the court at the initial hearing. Yeah, um, but just but for the record, I want to go ahead. All right. So, um, not to belabor this, but uh, the, the the email um, that was apparently submitted by Paul Silvernail, who's a respondent here, um, says uh, High Wilbur Hi Wilbraham Liberty Library staff. When a person enter, enters Tim Symington's name in the Google machine, this is the first thing that comes up from Mass Life. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Whoever Tim, hired Tim Symington would have known this, which means whoever hired him is a pedophile as well. Did I read that correctly? Yes. You will immediately fire Tim Symington, the seven victims in Longmeadow, and his own two children who demand it. How many victims does he have, have in Wilbraham because some Wilbraham Library pedophile hired him? Did I read that correctly? Yes. If you do not fire Tim Symington immediately, my family will work tirelessly until your reputations are worth as much as Symington. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Go ask Mark Brannigan what kind of a person I am and whether or not I destroy people who harm my family. Ask him about Steve Milicata, or however it's pronounced it. Uh, or ask the pedophile protector, first assistant DA, smart Steve Gagnon. Who's he? I don't know. Fair to suggest he was a, a, a district attorney in North New Hampshire County. To refresh your recollection? No. Okay. Or go ask Maura Healy why she participated in the conspiracy to keep Symington out of jail. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense because Maura really wants people to know she's a pedophile as she runs for governor. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Hopefully Turtle Boy will write about the town of Wilbraham who knowingly hired a child rapist after he was fired as a teacher for abusing seven children in Wilbraham classroom. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Long Meadow class. Well, I'm sorry, Long Meadow. By the way, um, did you, were you fired? No. 
And by the way, do you have, still have your teacher's license? Yes, I do. Um, we're at a minimum, when the entire Wilbraham Library staff was notified they had hired a pedophile, they did nothing. Did I read that correctly? Yes. If you want to understand how sick your society is, read why your children were harmed. Uh, did I read that correctly? Yes. Is that a, is that, is that a website uh, that Paul Silvernail is associated with? Yes. And uh, did, did that website uh, uh, cause a trigger to Mass Live in 2017? Yes. Uh, do you understand that in 2015? Hold on. All right. So what 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 objection to what I don't question, think, Mr. Sunnington? Well, there's certainly been no foundation laid as to how Mass Live came to publish the, the article they did uh, detailing the allegations against Mr. Sunnington. So I don't what, think you can answer that question. Well, what was it? Tell me the question. I the question to. was: Did that website lead to Mass Live publishing an article? Oh, about yeah, that's sustained. No, I'll, I'll, if he testifies, I'll certainly ask him some questions about that. Um, if you want to understand how sick your society is, read why your children were harmed up. I'm sorry, I already read that. My family did not ask you again to fire the child rapist, Tim Simington, Paul Silvani. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Okay. So this this hit 49 of your colleagues, correct? Yes. And uh, how did uh, that impact you? Well, I, I came to court seeking an order um, because I am currently in fear for my well-being, my wife's well-being, my family's well-being, and also the well-being of the staff that I work with. And, and had uh, you had any uh, prior interactions with Mr. Silvernail? I've never actually interacted with him other than a phone call in 2004. Had you uh, ever, hold on, I, I, I want to get this. You, you've never really, what, with him? Interacted I've never interacted with him. With him. What? what? I've never interacted with him other yeah. than a phone call in okay. 2004. And um, in 2004, uh, you were employed by the Long Meadow School System? Yes. And in 2004, were anonymous letters uh, uh, accusing you of some type of sexual mishandling of your children uh, anonymously uh, delivered to uh, uh, teachers at the, at your teachers at, long, at the, high, the, law, the middle school that you teach at? Uh, there weren't so many allegations. There were very sensitive court documents from a custody case. And in uh, 2015, uh, uh, was a lawsuit started against you uh, by Mr. Silvernail's wife and child? Yes. And child? Yes. And um, were those um, co copies of those complaints, were they disseminated uh, to uh, the parents of the students you taught at Glenbrook Middle School? Yes. What year? 2015. By, by, Mrs., by Ms. Silvernail? By Mr. Silvernail, yes. And by, um, by Mr. Silvernail, yes. I'm sorry, I missed the question. Hmm? I'm sorry, I missed the question. Um, we're, we're, uh, repeat uh, the question. In 2015, uh, did you come to understand that copies of a complaint that was that was filed against you in the Hampshire County Superior Court by uh, Miss Silvernail and her adult son, or whatever? Um, we're, we're, dis we're disseminated to every parent of every student that you taught at Glenbrook Middle School? I don't know if it was every parent of every student. I don't know how exactly how many copies of the packet were sent out. There must have been at least 50. And, and it's, at some point, uh, did, did, you res did, you, did, it, did that litigation cause you to, re to resign from the school? Or what? The packets created a situation um, like a forest fire, and I resigned as a result. Okay. And subsequent to that, uh, did you did you have any further uh, contact or, or uh, hearing from the Silvernail family about, or Mr. Silvernail himself about uh, your being a child <coughs> rapist? And uh, the website uh, that was um, referred to on Mass Live was created by Mr. Silvernail specifically to go after my reputation. And what impact did that have on you in 2017? It's made it impossible for me to get uh, a job as a teacher. Even though you have your license? Yes. Have you tried getting jobs at AIC? <clears throat> yes, I was hired at AIC as a professor and they rescinded the offer after two weeks because they saw the information about me online. How about the Diocese of Springfield? The Diocese of Springfield offered me a position as a teacher and they rescinded the offer after about two hours because they also saw the information about me online. Okay. And, and you're asking this court, are you not, to um, 
to have Mr. Silvernail um, re refrain from further harassing him? Yes. And has, this, has these, have these activities on his part, uh, you believe they were intended to cause you, to, to cause you, um, oh, but, but before I get to that, um, after the case in, in uh, Hampshire County, in Hamden County was settled, um, <clears throat> did Mr. Did, Mr. did you have an understanding that uh, Mr. Silvernail or, or, or his agents uh, reported your lawyers to the Board of Bar Overseers? Yes, they did. And what happened to that uh, complaint? Nothing happened with it. There was, there was no founding for any of it. And you've been, you've been investigated, have you not? Yes. By the uh, Department of Ch Child and Family Services? Yes. You've been investigated by the Department of Education, uh, the, what they call DESE? Yes. You've been investigated by uh, the East Hampton Police Department? Yes. The Holyoke Police Department? Yes. The Hampshire County District Attorney's Office? Yes. And at any time between 2004 and today, have you ever been charged for anything having to do with these spurious claims brought by Mr. Silvergate against you? Nope. And you can't get a job teaching? No, I cannot. Has your, um, have you developed PTSD? Yes. Has your marriage been impacted on this? Yes. And you want this thing to stop, don't you? Yes, I do. No further questions. Questions? Thank you, Ernie. So, um, you referenced um, a 2015 lawsuit filed against you. Um, by your, well, Cheryl Silvernail, she's your ex-wife, correct? Yes. And Connor Silvernail, he's your son? Yes. And they, he filed a suit in 2015 against you in the Hampshire Superior Court, correct? They both did, yes. yes. And they were alleging that you sexually molested Connor when he was a child. I am actually not able to answer that because part of the agreement was I'm not allowed to discuss any of the allegations so prior to the... You can answer the fact that they alleged something. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, they alleged. Right, so to repeat it, the, they alleged yes. that you sexually molested Connor when he was a child. They made those allegations. And when you resigned from, this, from um, working in Longmeadow in 2016, that was amid allegations from multiple students of, at the school of misconduct, correct? That, objection to that, Judge. That, that goes into the settlement of the, in the allegations. There was a settlement no. agreement of confidentiality on that. No, no. This is when he resigned from his teaching position in Longmeadow. Yeah. So, so he resigned. He wasn't fired. We established that. Right. But the, the, the objection is overruled. He can answer that question. So you resigned amid multiple allegations of um, misconduct. I did resign. Well, weren't there multiple allegations of misconduct made by children at the school? The judge, he, he admitted that. He started a firestorm. And they admit when you know, they he wants to right. object. You can object. We'll, we'll let him answer. Just right. let him answer. You can rehabilitate him if you need to. Go ahead. You admit seven students at Long Meadow made allegations of misconduct against you, and that's why you resigned. No, it was one specific student. And some of these allegations were um, inappropriately touching female students at the school. It was one student making an allegation. So this article in Mass Live that says Long Meadow teacher resigns amid allegations of student harassment and sexual abuse of his own children, which references seven students. That's incorrect? Yes, it is. So there's one student. Who made allegations, yes. And and that is the reason, in fact. Well, there were also allegations um, that you made threats, threats to hit students, what, weren't there? No. Allegations you were going to hit them with golf clubs? No. A baseball bat? No. Allegations that you frequently touched female students? That and made no. them uncomfortable? No. So those parts of the article are incorrect? Yes. But there was one female student who made allegations against you, and that's why you Again, resigned. Judge, I'm, I'm just going to make this objection. We're here today on a scurrilous uh, uh, email that was sent to 49 people, okay? The, the, the issues of, of his resignation, you know, there, it's, it's, as we all know, in resignations, he was not fired. He still has a teacher's license. So if he was that awful a person, he would have been fired or had, would have had a, you know, I think it's good for a I'll give Attorney Estes some leeway on that, but don't spend too much more time on it. But go ahead. Well, you're you can finish that question. 
So there were allegations, at least in the article, there were allegations made that you frequently touched female students. Multiple students came forward. That was what the allegations in the paper said. I was never asked by the paper. Well, you actually refused to participate in the investigation. You resigned, right? I could not. You could not what? I could not say anything. That was part of the agreement with Longmeadow. But you didn't participate in the investigation at Longmeadow. To avoid that, you resigned from your teaching position. Judge, Judge. Well, that's argumentative. Next question. Are you familiar with an individual by the name of Jade Silver? Yes. And are you Ooh, familiar with Attorney Essens? Yes, Your Honor. I, I have a hearing appointment November 28th. I, and now, I used to, uh, the female voice is used to, now your voice, when you, when you speak down, I'm losing what you're saying. <laughs> so project towards me, okay? Sorry. In fact, I'll step back. Yeah, that helps me project. Yes, that's good for both of us. So, Mr. Symington, you, um, are you familiar with an individual by the name of Jade Silver? Yes, she's my daughter. And Connor Silvernail is your son, correct? Yes. And these two uh, people are the stepchildren of Paul Silvernail? Yes. And you know that they have made allegations that you sexually abused them when they were children? I, I am aware. And you're also aware that they made these allegations to the police? Yes. And you haven't actually spoken to Mr. Silvanero in 18 years. Uh, nope. I, like I said, I had one phone call conversation with him in April of 2004. And of all of these emails that were sent, these were sent to other people, not to you directly, correct? Yes. And none of them contain threats to harm you physically? No. And none of these contain like a challenge to, to fight you? No. These are all full of allegations that you molested Mr. Silvernell's stepchildren? Yes. I have no further questions for Mr. Simonton. Any uh, redirect? Yeah, just a couple of questions. Um, Mr. Simington, um, although you never actually had um, met or had direct contact with Mr. Silvernail, he, you did receive this, or you do, were made aware of this, uh, this uh, email of September 29, 2022 from Mr. Silvernail to everybody you knew at your work, didn't it? Yes. And it's fair to say, sir, that that email was designed to destroy you, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And in fact, it has destroyed you, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Sit down. Nothing further. Okay. Hold on a second. So, I'm sorry. I know you have a That's not really how. Go ahead. Well, you're still employed there, right? Yes. Okay. So it hasn't destroyed your employment at the Wilbraham Public Library? No. Okay. No further. Okay. All, All right. right. Sit down. Yeah. Any, uh, any other evidence for, from the plaintiff? No. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I would just make a, a very brief opening so that you understand where I'm going with all of this. Okay. Um, first of all, I believe that all of this is protected speech. There's been nothing about a true threat or fighting. However, if the court were to make a finding that this is not protected speech, then I am going to call my witnesses to establish that what Mr. Silvernail believes to be true is in fact true. Um, by having his daughter and his son here today testify about the abuse that they suffered at the hands of their father. Because if it's true, it can't be malicious. You know, that, that is one of the most ridiculous arguments. If it's true, someone's got to make a determination whether it's true. The fact that they're saying it's true doesn't make it true. And the fact that you know, I'm, I've already suggested to the court that this matter has been vetted over 15 years without any investigation is uh, is probably so if he's planning to call the kids in uh, to uh, make this uh, into a circus i i i, I would do for I'm, I'm not making this into a circus if he believes it's true it's not malicious but i first of all i think it's all protected by the first amendment but if we're going to get beyond that that's fine if he believes it's true it's not malicious 
And I would call my first witness. Uh, hang on, hang on. It's, it's the way you would defend a defamation suit. Right. Um, just give me one second, okay? I'm, I'm just looking at a couple cases here, I, I, and who um, was guiding me, and... Um, well, it's, it, it's the O'Brien v. Borowski case, is sort of the seminal case. Yeah. Um, which says that the constitutional harassment under the statute, the speech in question must constitute fighting words or true threats. The fighting words exception to the First Amendment is limited to words that are likely to provoke a fight, i.e. face-to-face personal insults that are so personally abusive that they're plainly likely to provoke a violent reaction and cause a breach of the peace. Going on from there, we get into true threats. The true threats encompass those statements where the speaker means to communicate a serious expression of an intent to commit an act of unlawful violence to a particular individual or group of individuals. The speaker need not actually intend to carry out the threat, rather a prohibition on true threats prevents, protects individuals from the fear of violence and from the disruption that fear engenders. So you're gonna, that, those are the two types of language hmm. that are uh, proscribed uh, by har- a harassment prevention order. Nothing else. Well, hang on. So under civil harassment, but if you look at the basis uh, for issuance of a harassment prevention order can also be under criminal harassment. Certainly. And under uh, 43A, uh, 265-43A, and uh, it does boil down if the conduct uh, committed, uh, if the committed conduct or speech or a series of acts is are made willfully and maliciously. Um, and as I, I read this and I prepared for this, I, I agree with you, it's the O'Brien and Borowski and the civil harassment, true threats and fighting words are really the, what you're guided by. But I, I see there's more room, I believe, there's more room um, under the criminal harassment statute. And, um, well, the first, one question is whether this, this plaintiff is a public figure, um, which he may or may not be. And then secondly... Um, just give me one second, okay? I'm looking at the Commonwealth versus Johnson 470 Mass 300 2014 case, and in, in uh, where Johnson was convicted, and among other things, the defendants conducted and included posting information about the victims online, along with false statements about items that the victims allegedly either had for sale or giving things away. Um, uh, also, anonymously sent hostile, ominous communications to the victims. Um, and I thought there was an accusation of impropriety. Okay. But, General, I, I'm not interested in hearing, um, can't you make an offer of proof and can't we accept that both children would get on this? Well, they're not children, they're adults now. Well, yeah, both kids would, would testify that they, they, they've made an accusation of sexual assault. Well, I think I mean, the, isn't that all I need? I don't need the details of that to determine. I was not going to get into the details. I think, though, that you, Your Honor, if I prove, if I have witnesses testifying under oath that they were sexually abused as children by this man, and my client has taken actions based on his belief that that is true, this isn't malicious conduct. Right. Well, that, I, I think there's some, Attorney Kennefick, you know, if it's, if it was patently false, if you if, if and made up out of whole cloth, calling someone a pedophile, I'm with you. But if if there was an accusation, uh, I'm I'm swayed by that. But I don't want to I don't want to uh, like tear everybody up and start listening to accusations. So I guess it could be. Why can't Why can't I accept? Um, 
a stipulation that both those children would testify that they have a claim they were sexually assaulted, whatever, in 2000-something. When they were children, yes. When they were children. Can we just do that so we don't have to put everyone through that? Well, I guess then... I mean, you agree. He's already... Admitted it on cross, of course. I mean, there's allegations. He was investigated. I believe you. I agree with that, too. So, but can't you both stipulate that the children made allegations back in 2000? Around 2004. I mean, I'm not... I have prepared these witnesses. I have spoken with them. I'm not getting into the nitty-gritty detail. I think that that's beyond the scope of what's necessary here. It would be short. I understand what the court is saying because it becomes sort of a mini-trial. But I feel like I have to establish a reasonable basis for my client's belief that what he's saying is true. But it's already been established that there was an allegation. I mean, everyone's admitted that. Well, I guess it's on the plaintiff to decide whether he wants to stipulate. Well, even now that I'm changing my mind, that evidence is already in front of me. Both children made an allegation. He's admitted it on cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor. But unless you're telling me that the court is going to take that as true, I mean, I think that the question of... In other words, as you pointed out a moment ago, Your Honor, if what he was saying was made up out of whole cloth and just patently false, and he was just going after this individual for some unknown reason, that changes the calculus completely. But if his own children are telling him and have told him for years and have been in therapy, I mean, I would offer a lot of evidence on this subject that they were sexually abused by this man when they were children. I think that information and whether or not you believe it is credible affects the analysis. I couldn't disagree more. And, you know, I mean, we've got a couple of now adult children who have been probably gone through the Stockholm Syndrome for 15 or 20 years. And he could establish that on cross. Just let me finish, okay? Yeah. So, you know, it's like, you know, I don't know whether, you know, we want to have this kind of a... I don't think it's anything short of a tragic circus to... If he wants to put these kids on and they're going to testify, well, you did this and he did that, and then he's going to come back and we're going to say, well, you went to the police, didn't you? And they didn't believe you for whatever reasons. And this happened over and over again. And, of course, this fellow over here, you know, decides to, you know, single-handedly destroy this guy's life. You know, I'm suggesting, Judge, that, you know, I mean, this guy could have easily filed a defamation suit. And I wouldn't be surprised. It keeps swirling in my mind. But, you know, there's money involved. I'm understanding that there may be a criminal investigation. I'm not sure about that. But what I can say, Judge, is that this case and the allegations that are presented by him and that scurrilous, hideous note that he circulated to every one of his colleagues, as he's done over and over again, you know, fits squarely within the purview of those three elements that are necessary to have an active 258. All we're asking for is to leave this fellow alone. That's what we're asking this court to do, a very limited form of relief. All right. Well, gentlemen, I'm just writing down what I know we're not done. We're in the middle of a hearing. But I think it would be helpful for both of you to know I find that there is the evidence so far that have established that the children have made accusations of sexual assault in 2004 against the plaintiff and that those accusations have been investigated by multiple agencies and to date no criminal charges have been brought. What else do you need? I mean, OK, so now that's as far as I'll go. Call your next witness. Call Jade Silverdale. Your Honor, I'd have her stand here. No, you can stay. Or you can scoot over if you want. You can sit. I can't 
see Mr. Silvernail. He doesn't stand up like yeah. my client. Could you, could you stand? Uh, yep. No, he's not telling. Oh, oh, sorry. Jade. Jade. Excuse me. Okay. Please raise your right hand be sworn in. Be silently swear that the testimony you should give in this case now in hearing shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So, you got I do. Thank you. You'll have to speak. keep your voice up and speak into the microphone. If you could please state your name for the record and spell your last name. Jade Silvernail, last name S-I-L-V-E-R-N-A-I-L. And what's your date of birth? March 6, 1998. So how old are you? 24. Where were you born? Uh, Springfield, Bay State. And where did you grow up? Western Mass. What's your highest level of education? A ba bachelor's degree, elementary. What? An elementary teaching? And where did you, what degree? Elementary education. Okay. And where did you get your bachelor's? New England Baptist College. When did you graduate? 2020. And are you working? Yes. Where do you work? Westfield Christian Academy. And uh, what do you teach? First grade. How long have you been there? One year. So since, since this is your first job out of college? Yes. And what's your address? 245 Northwest Road, West Hampton. And who do you live with? Paul and Cheryl, or, uh, sorry. I live with my brother, Connor. You Connor's your brother? Yes. Okay, nice and loud for me. And how long have you lived there? Over a decade. And do you have any other siblings? Yes. What are their names and how old are they? Peter is 14 and James is 12. And who are your parents? Paul and Cheryl Silvernail. And do you know um, Timothy uh, Symington? Yes. And you understand why we're here today? Yes. Um, what's your relationship to Mr. Symington? He's my biological father. And what's your relationship to Paul Silvernail? He is my stepfather. And when did he marry your mother? 2004. And how would you describe your relationship with Mr. Symington today? Estranged. Is, estranged. And I'm going to keep this portion short. Um, why are you estranged? You know, Judge, I think you already, it's already been probably established by the by what your 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 testifying. I'm to, the, to have this. These, this is kind of. It's really kind of over the edge. Well, I, if, I'm not thrilled with it, but it's not out of bounds. O right. Overruled. All right. So you just testified that you're estranged from Mr. Symington. Why are you estranged? He raped me. And how old were you at the time? Five. Did you talk to the police about that? Yes. As far as you know, were charges ever brought? No. Have you been in therapy because of this? Yes. And did this abuse affect your ability to participate in life, school? Yes. How long have you been in therapy? I don't remember. And is your father, Paul Silvano, aware of this? Yes. And if you know, how does it make him feel? Angry, sad. I have no further questions. Okay. No, you have to stay. Sorry. Any questions? I just have one or two. Um, you've been interviewed by a lot of law enforcement folks, haven't you? Police officer? Uh, about, about, about this alleged rape you're claiming? I can only remember one. You only remember one? You ever remember being interviewed by Department of Children and Family Services? Yes. You ever remember being involved by the Holyoke Police Department? By what police department? Holyoke. I don't remember. East Hampton? I don't remember. Uh, District Attorney's Office in North East Hampshire County? I remember speaking with a detective. I do not remember okay. where they were from. Do you remember their um, putting you through any kind of tests or you know, interviews, that type of thing? I remember talking to them about what happened and okay. showing them. With and these, th these were police officers and detectives? Yes, one. Mm -hmm. Did you ever feel intimidated by them? I'm scared. Yeah, I'm well, sure you were. Of course, everyone would be. But, um, and um, as far as you know, as a result of what you told them, there was never any criminal action brought against your father, right? No. Nothing further.
Just to, one follow-up question, just to clarify. How old were you at the time? Five. About five. Okay. Thank you. I have no further okay. questions. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. Her last name is Silvernail? Silvernail. Okay. Yes. You know, I call Connor Silvernail. I will again keep this pretty short. Please raise your right hand to be sworn in. You saw I swear that the testimony issue in this case in our hearing should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So, up you guys. I do. Thank you. Could you please state your name for the record? Connor Silvernail. Uh, sorry, is this? Uh... Remember, you're talking to the judge. Oh, sorry. Nice and loud. This amplifies. Is this good? Yep. All right. Could you please st state your name and spell your last name for the record? Connor Silvernail. S I L V E R N A I L. And <clears throat> Connor, what's your date of birth? June 8th, 1994. So how old are you? 28. Where were you born? Coley Dickinson, uh, Northampton. Mm -hmm. And where did you grow up? In Northampton. And what's your highest level education? Bachelor's degree. Where did you get that? New England Baptist College. Um, what did you study? Secondary ed history. What year did you graduate? 2019. And what's your address? 245 Northwest Road, West Hampton. And who do you live with? My sister. And um, you heard her testimony about her siblings. You agree that you have two siblings, Peter and James? That's correct. Okay. And what are your, the names of your parents? Paul Jean Silvernail. And, and did, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. And uh, Cheryl uh, Silvernail. Cheryl? And, yeah. Do they visit you often in West Hampton? Yeah. Fair. And are you working? Yes. Where do you work? Andrus. What do you do for them? A uh, machine. Where do you work? Andrus. What is it? Andrus. Can you spell it? A N D R I T Z. It's German. Huh. What do they do? They make parts for. Uh, for paper machines. Okay. He's a mach you're, so you're a machinist? Yeah. Okay. And are you familiar with Timothy Symington? Yes. How are you familiar with him? He's my biological father. And do you understand why we're here today? Yes. And who is Paul Silva now to you? My stepfather. And what is your relationship with Mr. Symington? Are you close? Are you estranged? Estranged. And when was the last time you saw him? When it was like 18. And why is, do you not have a relationship with him? Because he molested me when I was little. And did you, in fact, uh, were you part of the lawsuit that was referenced earlier in the Hampshire Superior Court? Yes. And how old were you at the time? Said he molested you. How old were you at the time he molested you? About seven or eight. And how many times did it happen? Several. Did you, uh, did you also speak to the police about this? Yes. And are you in therapy for this? I was in therapy because of it, yes. For how long? Don't remember. For more than a year? Oh, yes. More than five years? Yeah, I should say so. And um, is your father aware of the allegations you've made against Mr. Symington? Yes. And if you know, how does it make him feel? <laughs> Angry, sad. I have no further questions for Connor. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, okay. No. Nope. Stay here. So, um, you were part of the lawsuit against uh, your your father uh, in 2015. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I take it. Uh, do you remember having interviews with police in connection with uh, these so-called allegations you made against your father? Yes. Yeah. And. Uh, you remember which police department? Holyoke. Remember East Hampton? No. Remember the Hampshire District Attorney's Office? No. Remember the Department of Children and Social Services? Yes. Yeah. And uh, when you had these interviews, was your mom with you? No. no. Did she give you notes in terms of what you're going to be saying to the police officers? I have no memory. Uh -huh. And. Um, 
you agree with me that transpired that did the police or those who interviewed you, did they give you, put you in through questionnaires or any type of tests or anything along those lines? Do you remember? Don't remember. You don't remember anything about questionnaires? Questions, interviews, asking you questions that might relate to inappropriate sexual activity. Remember any of that stuff? It's very vague. And of course, you do recall, of course, that as a result of those investigations, no charges were brought against your father, right? No. And you're comfortable being here today? Somewhat. And I didn't clarify, just to clarify, Connor, how old were you at the time that you spoke to the police? The Holyoke police? Yes. I do not remember. Well, were you a young child? Were you a teenager? Young child, definitely preteen. Okay. And you also spoke to DCF at some point? Yes. Okay. Nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being considerate. Thank you. Recall Paul Silverman. Thank you. Could you please state your name for the record? Paul Silverman. And could you spell your last name? S-I-L-V-E-R-N-A-I-L. And Mr. Silverman, where do you live? I live in West Hampton in Truro, Mass. How long have you lived in Massachusetts? 20 years. What's your highest level of education? I have a bachelor's from Columbia University. What year did you graduate? 1984. Are you working? Yes. What do you do for work? I'm a financial advisor. How long have you done that? Financial advisor, sir. I'm a financial advisor. How long have you been a financial advisor? 20 years. Slow down. Take a deep breath. Are you married? Yes. What's your wife's name? Cheryl Rihanna Silverhelm. How long have you been married? 17 years. Do you have any children? 18 years. Sorry? Sorry. I know. It's 18 years. 18 years. Do you have any children? Yes, I do. What are their names and ages? Connor's 28, Jade's 24, Peter's 15, and Jimmy is 12. And the two individuals who just testified that you referred, you referred to Jade and Connor, the two individuals who just testified, they were, they are your stepchildren, is correct. that correct? they are my stepchildren. Are you familiar with Mr. Symington? Yes, I am. When did you first become familiar with him? Mm, 2003 or so. Have you ever spoken to him? No, I've never spoken to him. Have you ever sent him an email? I've never sent him an email. And are you aware, obviously you're aware that Jade and, and Connor have alleged that they were sexually assaulted by Mr. Symington? Yes. And when the children were small, did you see, did this affect their behavior? Yes. Have they been in therapy? Yes. Have you published this information? Yes. With whom have you shared this information? Uh, with police departments, um, with a reporter, um, with anyone that I possibly can to be able to notify the world about what Tim Symington did to Jade Silvernail and Connor Silvernail. And what's your goal in sharing this information? To be able to expose Mr. Symington as the man who raped Jade and sexually abused Connor. But more specifically, like, why would you send this to his employer at Wilbraham Public Library? Because he is around children. He was around 500 children this summer at a summer reading program that he ran. And do you think that creates any kind of public risk or public danger? I know it does, based on his behavior toward Jade Silvernail and Connor Silvernail and the children that he taught at Glenbrook Middle School in Longmeadow based on the deposition testimony of superintendent of schools and the principal in Longmeadow. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Move to strike that. Sustain. The Glenn deposition testimony, I don't have it, so that's stricken. I don't have a whole lot of questions for you, Mr. Silvernail, but I do have a few. We can agree that this is marked as an exhibit uh, the, the, the email that you took it upon yourself to send to the 49 people of the library staff. 
Um, you, there was there, there was you who did that, correct? I sent an email, sir. You characterized it as 49 people to a library staff. It was to seven people of the library staff, and then there were 49 recipients. Most of those are law enforcement officials that have been involved in covering up the rape and sexual abuse of my children. Okay. So we, we can agree that uh, what, everything that you said in this uh, in the uh, email of September 20, whatever the date it is, 29. This is this is this is your you're the author of that. Correct. correct. All right. And you're also for the author of um, uh, you, you have a website, don't you? You harm my or something like that. Why your children were harmed. Okay. Correct, sir. And uh, you, you you use that to uh, to uh, continue your uh, uh, campaign against Mr. Semington to let everybody know what a horrible person he is. Correct. Correct. Can you please restate the question, sir? I said you use that website as a basis to publish to whoever would listen to you, whether it's Mass Live, uh, whatever uh, outlet you could find, to make sure that you would continue to destroy Mr. Simington's life, correct? I've not destroyed Mr. Simington's life. I'm asking you, well, did you, intend to hurt, did, you, did you intend to hurt him? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, we agree on that. Child rapists should be shamed yeah. and hurt. You're and, correct. Okay, and, and and you have a good faith belief that this that these kids uh, were raped by him, right? That Jade was raped. Okay. It's contained in Jennifer Sadler's police report. And uh, by the way, did you um in in your due diligence, Mr. Silvernail, gentleman who graduated graduate of Columbia, I believe, did you ever have to take it upon yourself to speak to any of the investigating officers who interviewed these kids? Yes, I did. And did I, I did speak with Mark Popolarczyk. I was interviewed okay. for over an hour. He's an East Hampton uh, detective. Who, and you didn't like what he had to say, did you? I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Okay, so are you talking about his police report, sir? Well, I'm just, let, me just, let me just make it easy. Sure. And it's late in the day. Of those, of the, of the people you invest, you spoke with, did you speak with anybody from the Hampton, Hampshire County District Attorney's Office? No. Did you speak with anybody from the Hawaii Police Department? No. Did you speak with anybody from the East Hampton Police Department? Yes. Okay. Did you speak with anybody from DCF? No. Okay. And, uh... I'm sorry. There was an investigator with the last name of Rodriguez. And after Jade and Connor had initially disclosed the findings, which resulted in the supported findings from DCF, Another investigator named Mr. Rodriguez came by, and I said hello to him at the door as I was going out to work. Yeah. And you, you know, don't you, that none of these folks agree with your position that these kids were raped. It right? is not my position, no. sir. Well, you know that no, not one off the law enforcement agency brought an action against them, did you? Not, right? not yet. <laughs> not yet. And um, you know what DCF does, don't you? What do they do? Well, you, you, you know that they were involved in this case, right? Yes. And they, they didn't do anything. They didn't put or find anything where Mr. Simington did something wrong? No, that's not true, sir. But do Mark, you have any evidence to show support that he did something wrong? Yeah, Mark, well, from DCF, sir. No. Do, do you have anything with you today? Is no, he I, with you? No, I don't, sir. Okay. Well, you're very well prepared for today, aren't you? Well, it's on the website, sir. No. Oh, your website. The one you're you're not just saying. Okay. Don't I mean, get argumentative. All right. All right. But so let me just summarize, sir. There are at least however many people in your September 29th, 2002 email that you notified about how awful a person Mr. Simington is and how dangerous he is and how your family is going to go after them if they don't do something, right? Isn't that what you said? You, you, I didn't hear. Is there, are you talking about okay. the email to the Wilbraham Public Library, sir? Let me just let me just ask you this one thing, right? If you don't fire Tim Sim Simington immediately, my Objection, family will work. This, this email speaks for itself. He yeah. read it into okay. evidence. Okay. All right. He admits he wrote it. All right. Fair enough. No, nothing further. Just, Your Honor, one final question. Um, I want to submit an exhibit. It's the article, the Mass Live article that was referenced. Um, Any objection? Do you have the article itself rather than just the testimony about it? No. Yeah. All right, I'll take it. Do you want to see it before I? No, I've, I've seen it. No, I've seen it. 
I don't have any questions for Mr. Silverman. You can okay. Defense rests. Yes, the defense rests. All right. Uh, I'll, you have plaintiff has burden of proof, so I'll hear from the defense first. <laughs> yes, of course. It gets confusing sometimes. People. It does. You got to remember the burden of proof. Yeah. Well, Your Honor, first, um, we were already talking a bit about protected speech. Um, I, I would direct the court's attention to, again, O'Brien v. Borowski, which is specifically talking about 25080s. It's specifically talking about harassment prevention orders. And according to that case, that's a, and that's a Supreme Judicial Court case, there are only two exceptions to pure speech. Two, two types of speech that can be regulated. And I know, Your Honor, you were looking at another case. I think I would, I would direct the court's attention to this 2012 case. I read, I read O'Brien versus Borowski today as well. Um, but go ahead. So, Your Honor, I would say, obviously, the, the speech in question must constitute fighting words or true threats. There's zero evidence before the court yeah. that that happened. Mr. Simington himself admitted on cross that there were no true threats and there were no fighting words in any of these. If somehow the court decides that the speech is not protected, I think the question then becomes whether my client has a good faith belief in what he's saying. And what he testified to is he's trying to keep Mr. Symington out of jobs where he'd be around children because he believes he's a pedophile. And he doesn't send these emails directly to Mr. Symington. He sends them to his employer because that's the person he thinks um, should have the information. In this case, it resulted in a two-day suspension, and he actually ended up keeping his job. That's not what Mr. Silverno wanted to happen, but that's what happened. But the point is, if he has a good faith belief in what he's saying is true, this isn't malicious. It's, it, it can't be malicious if he, if he has a good faith belief that it's true, and that's why he's distributing the information. And obviously, this has been going on for years. There was a a, a lawsuit in the Hampshire Superior Court. There were investigations. There's all kinds of information out there. And his own children testified under oath today before your honor that they were molested when they were children and it had a dramatic and immediate effect on my client. He believes it to be true and he has what, a reason. What, what if he recklessly disregards the truth? The truth. Your honor, I think that's, that, that's, that's the definition. under willful, couldn't it? Well, I think that becomes defamation. I, I think you still have the question of speech. I mean, willful disregarding the w disregard of the truth, his remedy is to sue for defamation, not a harassment prevention order. Well, I, uh, that's, go ahead. That's, I, harassment prevention I don't disagree order, with that. Uh, harassment prevention orders are much more narrow. And in fact, obviously, the statute was designed to protect people who are, you know, a woman, the reason the statute was written in the first place was because a woman was being stalked and couldn't get a restraining order, and the guy ended up killing her, and the legislature tried to create an avenue where somebody who's a victim of domestic violence or potentially could have, get some protection. We are far afield from the point of the statute. And this is a, trying to shove a square peg in a round hole. This is possibly a defamation suit. But even if you find that the speech isn't protected, I, I, that's not what this statute is for and it doesn't fit. He has an honest belief in what he's saying and he's targeting it to particular people. And I, I would suggest that in this country he has the right to do that. And I would ask the court to deny the request for a harassment prevention order. Well, Judge, um, it's 25 after 4 or so. You've been you've listened to this for about an hour. Let me suggest this by starting off. Um, I'm familiar with the, the cases, and uh, I, in this, you know, this is obviously it could very well be a, a, a defamation suit. Um, you know, defamation suits are very expensive. Um, and as a fellow in the library, I'm basically trying to run from job to job, he's basically uh, run out of town. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty devastating. His wife's here. Uh, he testified that uh, the impact of these statements, was he, this, 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 he made my job cross-examining very, very easy because he, had, he adopted everything I would have asked him mm -hmm. from 2004 to 2015, to 2017, AIC, the diocese, and now this, under the pretense, well, I want to make sure all the kids are safe because this guy's a child rapist. Well, then he tries to wrap it into the, the notion, well, this is protected speech, and I have a good faith belief that it is. Well, you know, if it's, you, you testify on, on, on 
cross-examination, at least the guy's pretty candid, that I didn't really investigate all these, the cops who were making these investigations. And don't forget, these police officers and these detectives who investigate child rape cases, they're specialists. And if they suspect, or they have a good reason to believe that there's something amiss, you know, there are places for these folks in our wonderful penal system. So I'm suggesting to you, Judge, at the outset, that even if he wants to say that it's protected speech, it's reckless disregard, because he could care less. He could have cared less. All he wants to do is to destroy this guy. And even though he didn't, you know, if he didn't say, well, I didn't push him, or I didn't, you know, I didn't kick him or doing something like that, I just wanted to destroy him. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman.